So this is Mohamed Reza Ashuri, or you can call me Mo, and uh, in this last presentation, I'm going to talk about how to enhance basically security in Polkadot and Substrate by navigating Rust and blockchain vulnerabilities. So mostly I focus on Rust, and I assume that maybe you are not Rust developer, so I try to also talk about some basics uh, within this given time. And uh, briefly about myself, you know, I got my PhD in cybersecurity in 2020, um, from the University of Potsdam. Then I did my postdoc in uh, system security in 2021 and uh, from the University of VT, Virginia Tech. And um, you can actually um, follow me regarding you know, security content and software security issues and um, blockchain security ID tips and tricks mostly um, on Medium. You, know, you can follow my blog there or you can just follow my YouTube channel. Uh, or my GitHub, sometimes I put my ideas and tools and things like that there, or on LinkedIn. And if you have any question or you have any idea, just feel free to drop me an email or contact me on um, Telegram. So, uh, yeah, so now let's get started. So what is Rust? Um, I assume that some of you know about Rust, but if you don't know, I quickly talk about that. So Rust actually originally uh, introduced as a safer alternative to C and C++ in terms of memory safety and uh, basically gaining the same performance. And uh, so it's not just for blockchain development, it's basically it has been um, out there for a while and you can use that for doing anything from, operating, from creating an operating system, system programs, endpoints, even web applications, and of course blockchain apps like in Solana, um, substrate for you know Polkadot or Algorand and many other chains, and uh, it's essentially a statically typed language. That means you know every variable and uh, expression type needs to be determined and checked during the compilation time. So it's not like Java that we do this stuff basically at runtime. And uh, the main goal of the security model in Rust is to basically having a proper memory safety and error detection mechanism in place. So your final outcome or build uh, is relatively better than uh, many other languages comparing to C or C++ in terms of security and memory safety. And uh, now let's talk about Rust security model. So how it works. So the core concept or abstract in Rust security model is based on the concept of ownership and type system. So the ownership here is enforced by a core component, which is called borrow checker. So if you are familiar, for example, with uh, garbage collector in Java, this is something similar to that, but uh, there are some advantages. Um, for instance, if you use like garbage collector, it uh, basically reduces the runtime performance of your Java binary at, uh, or, run, uh, or Java process because it performs its operations you know, at runtime. And whereas in uh, Borrow Checker, we perform this stuff during the compilation time. So the main goal here is to provide a safer, you know, like I said before, memory safer and uh, optimized um, Rust binary or binary code. And that's why actually it's very popular among uh, blockchain core developers. And you see uh, many popular blockchains uh, use Rust as the main language. Of course, there are Golang. Solidity and so on, but Rust is a very popular language uh, from that perspective. Um, yeah, so now let's check the borrow checker and see how it works via an example. So here we have a C, C++ code. So does anyone know, um, is there anything wrong with this code or not? And if anything wrong, what's the issue? Can somebody tell me about it? Uh, can you speak louder? Sorry, I can't hear you. Right, that's correct, yeah. So in this code, basically, it's very simple, you know, a snippet code here to illustrate the point. At line six, we have a pointer, and we use basically the function str uh, dop to create a, um, to allocate the memory space for this literal here, for hello, and basically assign that memory to this pointer. At line seven, basically, through the, the free function, we uh, deallocate this space, and here x is a dangling pointer. So dangling pointer uh, cause memory leaks and un basically undefined, unexpected behavior in the code. At, when at line eight we try to print, you know, 
the outcome of X in a string format in console. Uh, basically, we have a we might have different situation, unpredicted basically situation, undefined situation. We might get memory violation. We might actually print some random or garbage value in the memory because that, that part of memory is already deallocated. It's free for other processes to, take, to use that and use their own content. It may also um, show some credentials or sensitive information from the other processes. So if you try to compile and run this code in any, I would say, a standard C, C++ compiler now, you can smoothly do that without probably getting any warning or any issue or things like that. So you get the binary um, and you miss out this problem. So just imagine what happened if you have like large industrial code with few thousand, few million lines of code, you know, and you might get a lot of tricky problems at runtime um, when you write your code in C or C++. So here is the, the equal, uh, equal basically conversion of that code you know, in, in the Rust. So here, if we try to compile that, um, we basically, the bottle checker uh, catch us at line um, four and stop the compilation process. So at line two, we basically declare, this, declare X and then we uh, assign that to the uh, string object hello and then at line three, we drop that. So we give this ownership. So take away and then at line four we try to uh, print the content of that so here this x actually is not valid any longer and basically borrow checker check this out make this interpretation and say hey i cannot basically compile your code so that's basically provide you know this this example shows how a borrow checker basically try to make you know a secure code and produce that for us um, but there are some caveats to that i mean if you write your code in ROS or you get some project or third party libraries in, or crates we call them in ROS is not always safe. And the reason why is because um, some developers or I would say many developers uh, also use unsafe blocks. So why they use unsafe blocks? Um, because later on actually I talk about that because unsafe blocks give you some flexibility so you can actually um, access memory directly. You can uh, temporarily disable the borrow checker. Um, and um, you can get around uh, some, some basically restriction there. And uh, for example, here is the modified version of the previous code, and um, if you try to compile and run that, basically it works without any issue and problem. So I actually conducted the research in 2020 regarding um, using unsafe code block in Rust, and you can find this you know, in this the link here, and I found at that time a large number of open source uh, third parties, for example, for encryption, network uh, communication, and so on, they uh, partially use unsafe code. So there was different motivation, but from my understanding, one, one main motivation was um, to beat the benchmarking you know, from the alternative libraries and perhaps libraries in C or C++ to, to gain similar you know, performance or even better performance. Because when you have the unsafe code, you might have in many cases better performance. And there are also other reasons, for example, interacting with uh, other code, like in the code, for example, a driver or uh, another SDK, which is in C or C++ or assembly or something like that. And um, so not necessarily all the time you use like Rust code, it's safe because it could have also unsafe code and you get similar outcome like using C or C++ code. So there are some limitation to the Rust security model. Um, one is actually memory leaks, so essentially the borrow checker and the, the, the core security model in Rust doesn't really care about memory leaks. And why is like that? Because uh, from the Rust perspective, you know, we don't like to have un undefined, unpredicted, you know, behavior at runtime. So memory leaks actually not mostly lead to that issue, right? Uh, however, we know from the security uh, standpoint, it can actually cause a lot of problem. For example, having a lot of wasted memory that basically bring down the performance of your code. And also, uh, it may, in some cases, actually expose um, sensitive uh, information, credentials, uh, private keys, and things like that. So it's not a cool thing, you know, but uh, that's the way it is. So this link here, actually, um, um, you can find more topics and debates around uh, security leaks and problems basically uh, in the Rust security, mo uh, security model. And the other main reason from my perspective is complexity. Um, 
when you use basically a Rust uh, without unsafe block, um, for example, in this case here, um, you might face some sort of complexity. So maybe you can have a look at this snippet code here and tell me what do you think about this code? Is this a memory safe code or it's unsafe? What do you think, guys? Uh, loud? It's a memory safe code, right. Um, however, if you try to compile this code, um, Ross, uh, the bottle check actually stopped the compilation. And uh, uh, it's not very cool with that. So you got this, this error here. So why is it like this? This code essentially is safe. Um, we have a um, mutable vector. We initialize that with three items. And then we have an iterate um, um, uh, iterate it, you know, and then we, uh, it, uh, through the method iter, we iterate throughout v without giving its uh, ownership. And then we uh, basically at line four, we advance, you know, uh, the element of um, uh, the iterate. At line five, we try to replace uh, the, the um, slot uh, index two, uh, which would be five, with three, we replace that. At line six, we, again, we advance um, the iterate, you know, and so far so good. So we don't have any, logically we don't have any um, memory violation here. However, the bottle checker um, basically stops us and doesn't allow us to compile this code and it says this is not safe, it's not okay. Um, so there are many actually situations that bottle checker actually uh, stop you and make challenges for you. You need to modify your code, you need to change the scope or drop, you know, um, Variables, you know, which is not really cool if you want to have like a huge, large scale industrial code. So it would be a little bit um, painful, right? So if we just, you know, uh, try to compile and execute the, the same conversion of that previous code here in Rust or in C or C++, um, basically it works with, um, and it gets compiled and executed without any um, issue. So um, if you'd like to know more about the um, undefined behavior in Rust and how it works, I would recommend you this, this link here, you know, this web page, and you can find a lot of cool stuff about the a wide range of uh, undefined uh, behavior in Rust, what is considered undefined um, um, or what's not. So apart from that, you know, uh, some, some developers and especially beginners think that Rust provides everything in terms of security and if you use a Rust code, for example, without unsafe um, blocks, your code is fine, you have security because you use Rust. So it's not very true. Like I said before, we have memory leaks issues. We have logical issues, for instance, if you, for your DAP, for your blockchain app, you have some mechanism for staking or vesting or um, account management and things like that. If your logic has issues, um, basically people can exploit that despite your programming language, what, what do you use, Rust or any other language. Um, we don't have, you know, it doesn't guarantee the lack of, you know, data uh, verification and sanitization, which is part of, again, logical issue. And it also doesn't care about your security policies. You might have wrong security policies, um, allow people, unauthorized user to uh, manipulate something and access some, some resources. So yeah, so the bottle checker is not everything, especially for a wide range of security challenges. So you got to um, um, take basically other approaches um, in order to enhance your code security. Of course, one of the first uh, approach is unit testing. Um, you don't need to have very deep knowledge about uh, security analysis, so you can use unit testing. When you write a function, um, you need to test that with, um, and make sure that function actually works with the given data, with expected data, and what, how it reacts with unexpected data. So that's actually quite important, even though it's simple and doesn't really provide security because it enhances the readability of your code. And uh, many security firms, blockchain security firms, and also freelancers, including me, uh, usually don't accept um, a blockchain code, for example, for IDIT, if that code doesn't have unit tests. Because, you know, it's just that you don't have the basic things. And the next measure would be uh, using FOSS testing. So if you're familiar with fuzzing, fuzzing, um, I would say it's like unit testing on a steroid. 
because it allows you to basically battle test you know, your functions, different functionality of your code with uh, various you know, permutation of data and try to basically break that code down. So that's the main intention. So here is not like in contrast to unit testing that you, know, you just introduce few uh, input and you see how function react. You introduce unexpected various input here to a f particular functionality and try to break it down and make it more battle tested. So it can help you a lot to figure out different different um, potential you know, issues there. And of course, manual code review, that's very important because um, uh, you might have logical problems like um, and situation that, that they are complex that are necessarily memory safety related. And in these scenarios, you know, you need like a human, you know, some, some expert or maybe some tools and a combination of them to analyze your code, understand what's going on and um, you know, figure out and report issues. So there are a whole bunch of you know, CLI, free open source tools. As Rust developer, you can actually use them to enhance your code security. So they don't need basically necessarily background in security and so on. So here are a few of those. Um, and they can help actually to enhance your security with, with just with, um, with a very short amount of time. So one of them is Cargo Edit. Perhaps you are familiar with that if you're a Rust developer. So essentially, Cargo Edit, you know, scan the cargo log file. This file contains information about dependencies and uh, creates uh, libraries that is in the, your code. You might have a lot of, you know, when you design, for example, a blockchain app or an industrial program, you might use a lot of public or private you know, third parties, and those codes, you don't know what's going on into them. Maybe there are some unsafe block, maybe there are some vulnerability there. Your, your host code might be safe and perfectly audited, you know, but you don't know about any updates of those third parties that later on you introduce to your code. So that, those basically third parties, they can also introduce security issues. So Cargo Edit simply scan this, look for third parties you use in your code, and take advantage of a public open database. It's called RASSEC Advisory Database. So if there is any public known vulnerability in any of those you know, dependencies, it just report to you. So it's good to know that, of course, it doesn't function when you have like private um, crates that you got it from another person or you found it just on the internet somewhere. So, but it still is better than nothing, right? The other tool is Clippy. Uh, this, this is a really cool tool, actually. Uh, it's like a linter, but it also gives you some, not only helps you out to update you know, and upgrade the performance of your code, enhance your code quality, but also it finds some security vulnerability, some patterns and so on, such as insecure random number generators, and many different things, you know, uh, which is actually a cool tool. And uh, you can add this part of your CI CD pipeline, so in order to enhance, you know, the quality of your, your product. And the last one is called uh, Cargo uh, Geiger. And um, this is actually a very useful tool, another CLI tool that um, um, it can help you out to minimize the use of unsafe code. Like I said, you might use third parties, crates, and so on. And uh, within those crates, you might have unsafe code blocks. So you know that if you have unsafe code block, there might be some memory violations there as well. So there might be not any um, public vulnerability, public report about them, so it can be, cat it can be caught by uh, Cargo Edit. But here, at least you, know, you have these unsafe blocks and you can do your own homework and check those code by yourself and make sure that um, you don't have those issues. So this is also kind of cool tool. Um, yeah, so that was about ROS, and now let's talk briefly about um, Substrate. Um, so as you know, Substrate is a framework, is open source Rust based you know, framework introduced by Parity. So it's essentially a, you know, a pack of tool chain you know, allowing you to create you know, uh, blockchain, pallets, you know, and a smart contracts um, faster, easier. So if you want to create blockchain, you can create either a standalone network or you can design it to connect to the uh, Polkadot network as a parachain. You can create pallets. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with pallets, pallets are like, um, if you're familiar with OOP, object-oriented programming, so I would say pallet is like a black box, you know? So you have a whole bunch of functionality encapsulated in a box, for example, for authorization, for staking, for governance, and so on, and you can just use these reusable, basically, packages into your code to create your blockchain faster and, um, and maybe um, better, it depends on the, the quality of the pallets. And 
you can also design a smart contracts even though the main uh, functionality of um, Substrate is not for a smart contracts. It's more associated toward you know uh, foundational aspect of blockchain, but throughout palettes like the frame uh, contract palette, you can also um, create a smart contracts. Um, so there are actually a wide range of vulnerabilities. Um, if you perform security audit, you may you know face with them, and there is no name or any public you know. Um, uh, reference for them, but uh, here are some of the common vulnerabilities, you know, and um, I'm going to briefly talk about them and introduce them to you. We have insecure randomness, storage exhaustion, unsafe arithmetic, unsafe conversion, uh, reply issues, and outdated crates. And if you, as a Rust developer, your code, your Rust code actually has security problem, you know, out of this scope, um, those issues, those Rust level issues can also propagate to your blockchain app despite using Substrate or any other framework. So now let's talk about insecure randomness. What is that? So randomness is a crucial part of any software essentially, not just for Web2, Web3, but also for Web2 traditional software. We need basically randomness uh, in many different you know, conditions, for example, for voting, um, selecting like nodes or you know users and many other basically functionality and one of the old basically issues is a predictability of some of these pseudo randomness basically uh, algorithms and code so it has basically a very long history but it become very serious when we talk about blockchain apps because here we deal with you know financial asset directly and for example if you have a lottery code or something like that a voting system so you don't want people you know take advantage of um, your randomness and predict the next move or manipulate or doing something nasty there so yeah like i actually mentioned here it arises from using we call predictable randomness sources uh, which could be potentially manipulated or anti anticipated by malicious actors. Um, for instance, in, uh, in Substrate, using a collective uh, flip um, palette um, might actually introduce this problem to you, you know? So it's not a very safe palette here um, for randomness. Um, the reason why is the, the core algorithm here is uh, the randomness is directly uh, influenced by the past block hashes, uh, past 81 basically blocks. And uh, because of that, it's for, for hackers, it's basically possible to predict the next, um, um, next random basically digit. And uh, they can also, depending on network, might actually impact your previous block hashes as well. And because of that reason, we consider this as a predictable uh, randomness um, source and it's not cool to use that and uh, what would be the mitigation of course don't use this you can come across with your own algorithm you can create your own palette maybe a secure palette and introduce that to the community or you can use basically VRF or verifiable random function um, from the palette babe so the the other actually um, common issue which actually has some roots into you know logical problems I would consider that as a logical issue as well uh, is when there is no proper charging you know algorithm or mechanism for using a storage so if the cost of a storage for users be very cheap you know um, in this case you know some some malicious actors can take advantage of this low storage cost to bloat basically your code storage right and that results in uh, in um, basically performing some kind of DOS attack on your system and network, sluggish the network and make it very expensive to maintain. So um, how to mitigate that? There are uh, many approaches, but of course this is more algorithmic approaches. You need to, for example, have some, I would say some limits on certain users. You need to, for instance, have a dynamic um, way to increase the storage costs for, for a user that wants to have a big chunk of memory, big chunk of storage. And uh, adding some limits, you know, not allowing a single user, for example, to, uh, to exploit that. Um, and uh, that's mostly about the, your, your, your algorithm and uh, it's kind of logical issues. So um, the other problem is unsafe arithmetic. So if you compile your Rust code basically in, in debug mode, if you write this code, and you have some sort of, you know, overflow or underflow issue, in the debug mode, um, 
Rust basically crash. So your code basically crashes, panic and crash. So, but if you use the same code uh, in the uh, in the release mode, uh, Rust actually silently try to avoid that by wrapping around those those occasions like these overflow or underflows. So why is tricky? Because for instance, if you have some asset management or balancing or something like that in your code in your in your blockchain app, and uh, you know you miss this out, uh, it may actually result in inaccurate numbers. So it may uh, result in having you know, inconsistent um, balancing for users. So some hackers can actually take advantage of that by performing some sort of overflow and underflow in order to um, get more tokens, for instance. So you need to take, uh, be very careful about this issue because, you know, as I said, Rust actually in the, um, in the release mode, in the production mode, um, um, does not cr panic, so you will maybe miss it out. So how you can actually mitigate that? You can use like safe um, arithmetic or mathematical functions like checked uh, underlying add or checked underlying sub to to make sure about the safety of you know um, your arithmetic operations in your code. Uh, the other one is uh, very similar: is unsafe conversion. So the main point here is when you you got to be very careful about um, downcasting or try to avoid. Uh, perform any kind of downcasting in your code. So it happens usually when you try to convert uh, one numerical type to another without proper checks, you know. And this can actually, again, cause some sort of overflow, underflow, and having inaccurate, you know, um, result. And again, it can be exploited by, by attackers. So, uh, or maybe causing, yeah, any various type of, you know, unexpected behavior in your code, you know. so. It hurts the sp stability of your your um, your app. So how you can mitigate that? Um, again, you need to have proper checks in place during type conversion. You know, try to avoid downcasting, and try to use a safe um, conversion methods like unique underlying saturated underlying into. Of course, there are many other methods. You know, I I put them on my GitHub. You know, and my blog, so you can have a look and sample code and. Uh, mitigations and so on. So the other issue, which is actually quite interesting, is reply issue. Um, this issue, you know, is um, mostly coming from um, improper handling of transaction nouns. So that allows an, you know, uh, attackers to repeat transactions, you know, same transaction, and perform some sort of DOS attack on your, your um, on your nodes, on your endpoints. And this is very interesting because actually I recently have seen that in some of my audit projects. Um, I had recently some um, Cosmos SDK chains and Golang code, and actually I saw that frequently a lot of places. And it can relatively uh, easily be exploited by hackers. You know, they can basically uh, take down your node or maybe your entire network here. So again, it might be, uh, you can, uh, mitigate that by ensuring that nouns are correctly um, set up in system. You have proper logic, you know, to handle that, having some limits, you know, and prevent transaction repetition. And the last one is outdated crates. You know, this is also a Rust problem, but it get worse when you do it, you know, on blockchain on substrate. So if you use like outdated, you know, unsafe or incompatible version of dependencies or crates as we call them, it can actually propagate some sort of or introduce some sort of inconsistency um, to your code and cause not only vulnerabilities and security issues, but also performance problem. And it's also difficult in terms of expanding the code and code development. So here, if you take a look at this uh, cargo log file, you can see user here, actually developer here, used different version of you know substrate, and uh, that makes your code um, messy, you know, and also int probably introduce you know security issues, inconsistencies, and so on. So. The mitigation is quite straightforward. Use the newest and safest version of dependencies. Ensure, ensure the consi um, consistent versioning across all your crates. So yeah, that, that was it. You know, that was my presentation. Um, I tried to make it short and brief for you know, a starter space. And if you are interested in those kind of topics, you need to more details about them, seeing a snippet code, maybe live, you know, um, um, security analyzers and things like that you can follow me you know throughout these links and thank you very much for your time